Uh, but first, let me say thank you so much for sharing this project with me. Um, I was able to watch it and it was it's just unlike anything I've ever seen before. So welcome to Obsessed Show, a podcast that is designed to inspire, featuring some of the most creative people in the world. I'm your host, Josh Miles. Let's talk about today's episode. Today on Obsessed Show, I'm excited to chat with the creative team behind the immersive and creative new VR film, On the Morning You Wake. On January 13th, 2018, at 8.08 a.m., an alert was issued to 1.4 million citizens of Hawaii. Ballistic missile threat inbound to Hawaii. Seek immediate shelter. This is not a drill. I can't imagine receiving that message here in Indianapolis. On the Morning You Wake uses innovative documentary and storytelling and virtual production techniques to viscerally recreate the lived experiences of people who for 38 minutes had to react and make impossible decisions in the face of nuclear violence. Steve Jameson is an Emmy Award winning BAFTA nominated director, producer and co-founder of London production company Archer's Mark and co-director and copywriter of On the Morning You Wake. Michaela Chernaski holland is the Emmy, Webby, and Sheffield Doc Festival award-winning storyteller and impact producer for the film. And Lovely Umayam is the founder and chief creative producer for Bombshell Toe, an arts collective pushing for an active exploration of arts, culture, and history to promote nuclear, non-proliferation, arms control, and disarmament, and impact fellow for the film. So without further ado, please enjoy this conversation with the creative team from On The Morning You Wake. Okay, kids, all the way from North London, New York, and Los Angeles, Steve, Michaela, and Lovely, welcome to Obsessed Show. Hey, Joseph. How do you? You Hello, know, thanks for having us. Yes, thank you. I'm really excited to talk to you guys. You know, this was, um, I feel like this was like a little news item that I remember hearing in the back of my head, like, oh, that's crazy. And then I don't remember hearing anything about it ever again. Um, so when when we had the chance to talk, you know, we've been scheduling this for uh, at least weeks, if not months. Um, I bumped into a friend of mine at a coffee shop and he was like, you working on anything cool? And I was like, oh, this is a really cool thing that just happened. You know, we don't have this conversation scheduled yet, but we're talking about this VR film that's about this moment in Hawaii. And the young lady who is across the counter working as a barista said, are you talking about on the morning you wake? And so like super small world, but like the first time I mentioned the film, someone with an earshot knew what I was talking about. So that, that was that was a pretty cool moment. Um, I know that we have lots of ground to cover today, especially with all three of you taking time to be on the show today. Uh, but first, let me say thank you so much for sharing this project with me. Um, I was able to watch it and it was it's just unlike anything I've ever seen before. So um, it's a it's a really cool opportunity to uh, uh, just to have experienced it and then to chat with you guys about how it all came together. Steve, maybe um, maybe we start with you. I'm curious what your connection was to this story and what kind of drew you to this project. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a great question, and um, I will try and give a, a succinct answer, but it's, uh, it's quite a circuitous one. So um, it, I come from a much, uh, I guess, what, what some might consider a more traditional film background, you know, of um, spent the last uh, decade or possibly even two um, creating documentary, feature documentaries, um, branded content, feature films, uh, writing, directing, producing across all of those kinds of projects. But um, um, with one of our previous documentaries, we created a, a sister uh, immersive piece, um, which that was Notes of Blindness. And, and uh, Notes of Blindness, I, I guess, um, had um, received plenty of accolades in the, in the immersive world. And, and it was that um, through um, having experienced Notes of Blindness that Games for Change were first introduced to our work. Um, so in terms of how we became involved in this project, and I, I think it's, um, worthwhile to say, it, you know, the, the front end of this project, it, it wasn't anything to do with Hawaii. Um, the Princeton University um, uh, Department of um, Science and Global Security had, had approached um, Games for Change, who were not for profit. And I'll, actually, I'll let um, Michaela explain more about Games for Change later. But they'd, they'd approached them to say, 
what they wanted to do was re-engage the conversation around nuclear threat and 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 um, perhaps you know bring it up today and bring it to a, a new audience um and so they were um, contemplating you know making an immersive piece about um, the realities of nuclear threat in 2018 as it as it was then and so uh, games could change i think they canvassed um you know or, or reached out to several creative teams and we were lucky enough to be involved in one of those conversations and when they first brought it to us this was something that really resonated with, with us as well. It's a creative team to Mike and, and Pierre and Arno and myself. This is an issue that's, that's deeply important to us. So we were very happy to engage with it. Um, and luckily enough, they, they brought us on board. Um, but w- one of the first things that, that happened is when we, we sat down with the, the team from Princeton, was we, we found ourselves discussing how we could, um, I suppose, how we could engage an audience and get them past some of the, the issues that often prevent, you know, audiences engaging with the, the nuclear issue, whether that's, um, it, it can, I guess, to some people, it can feel like something which is very hard to get past the stats or to get past the data, or it can feel paralyzing when you realize that you're just one individual in this, you know, giant global political superstructure and you have you have no agency. And, and so what we wanted to do is really create an an emotional response. And so we found ourselves asking how we create that emotional response. And we were really fortunate that one of the, um, one of our fellows at Princeton University at the time, Tamara Lulino Patton, she's um, from Hawaii, uh, but also a nuclear specialist. And she started, she opened a phone and she started reading text messages to us. And I think at the time it was March, 2018. So just a few months after that event. And as she was reading these text messages that were sent from friends and family who were genuinely desperate in that moment, um, we realized that, that that singular event was, was, was going to be the key to unlocking this um, um, uh, emotional response to the material. And through that, we could uh, you know, explore the bigger issues of, of, of nuclear threat. So I guess that's the, that's the most succinct uh, way I could explain how we, how we came into the project. And obviously from there, it was then, okay, well, how do we, you know, marry the macro and the micro of, of, of um, that issue. Michaela, can you tell us a little bit about your connection to the film? Sure. So my role in the film is impact producer and creative strategist. Um, what that basically means is Steve and Archer's Mark and Atlas, we have full, um, full understanding of what's happening inside the headset and how people are experiencing the actual virtual reality documentary. And then it's my job to take that documentary outside of the headset in both digital and physical formats. So I'm thinking about things as simple as social media, newsletter, general marketing, all the way to, you know, physical installations and activations we're working on with high level partnerships from the Nobel Peace Center to the uh, Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons meeting of state parties in Vienna, thinking about how we're activating the piece there. And then we're also thinking about the actual experience design, which is how are we onboarding people into not only the VR headset, but also this idea around nuclear weapons and the idea that these things still exist and that they are really scary, but how do we also make sure people walk away understanding that there is hope and there is a movement of people who have been working tirelessly to eradicate the world of nuclear weapons. And that's really where Lovely actually fits in perfectly to this conversation because that's a part of where Lovely's expertise comes in as both an impact fellow, as an artist, and as someone who has a background in experience design. So my team's been working really closely with both Steve and Lovely, um, and we're sort of the center point of that bridge between in making impact for the public, making impact for government dignitaries, making impact for students and teachers with education, while still staying true to the creative of what Steve and the incredible team at Archer's Mark and Atlas V has put together, and also relying on the incredible expertise of folks who've been working in this field and working in this nuclear disarmament movement for years and years. Well, that's maybe a good segue. Lovely, you want to tell us a little bit about uh, your role and connection to the film? Yeah, sure thing. So again, as Michaela mentioned, I am an impact fellow for On the Morning You Wake. I actually onboarded on the later side of the project. Um, I was not part of the film production process, but where I really come in is to be the liaison between sort of the film team and the nuclear policy field. So my background, uh, I've been 
doing research on nuclear non-proliferation, arms control, and disarmament for 10 years now. I've had a chance to work in government, in non-government settings, and I'm always surrounded by nuclear policy experts who know so much information but really don't have the opportunity to connect that information with a public audience. We sort of exist in this bubble Mm -hmm. where we just exchange knowledge, um, pretty much pass it on to like government representatives and we're very contained. But that isn't really a sustainable way of 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 knowledge production and and sharing when you really don't have an outlet to communicate that to the public, especially something like this that can impact them um, to the degree of, of, you know, fearing for their lives. Um, On the side, I'm also an artist and community organizer. And so um, I try to really connect my nuclear policy work through community engagement and again trying to to bridge sort of the the global security issues with sort of local stories and because of my work um it became like a very sort of natural connection with on the morning you wake given that the film is about pairing knowledge and emotion and action Um, And so that's where I really come in as an impact fellow. Um, And I've just been really, I think, um, lucky to be able to do multidisciplinary projects on uh, nuclear issues. I'm curious, you know, as I um, think about most documentaries I've ever seen, um, this concept could have totally worked as a traditional documentary, you know got the camera set up and you're kind of looking off screen and your <laughs> interview and talking to the people and showing B-roll of the island and showing B-roll of footage of, you know, rockets taking off. Um, but you guys took such a different route on this as a VR film. And I want to get into the aesthetics here in a second, but what was, what really drove you to make this an immersive VR piece and not a traditional documentary? So yeah. that, oh, I would say just to, just to frame it, um, Games for Change in Princeton University, um, when they began that relationship, the goal was always to make a VR experience. The goal for Princeton University was to say, how can we get people to have a deeper understanding? Because a cyclical issue we're seeing with traditional media is that people feel that they can kind of keep at arm's distance. It doesn't really, it creates an amazing impact, but people are sort of saturated in traditional media now. So when Princeton University approached Games for Change, it had always been with a mindset around using immersive um, filmmaking or 360 filmmaking or virtual reality experience design. And then from there, they sort of sent the call out. And then I'll let Steve speak to why it felt even more compelling once they got to sink their teeth into some creatives. Yeah, I think, look, you know, the the truth is that the the threat of a potentially civilization-ending nuclear event is... Um, not that improbable, but incredibly difficult to imagine. And it's such an incredibly abstract concept mm. that the more you speak to people about it, or you, if you try and engage people with it, um, I guess the, one of the instincts is that our, you know, our brains don't actually want to engage with that. So if it's a tr- traditional linear documentary, as Michaela said, it's quite easy to keep at, at arm's length. And so the beauty of VR is that it allows us to take users and place them right at the center of that experience. So we're not watching somebody and, you know, having them, re- you know, account their or recount their experiences from that day. We're actually in that moment, living that moment with them. And we're understanding that fear, not firsthand, but as close as possible as, as possible as we can. Um, and so for me, that's why VR lends itself um, so well to this story, because at the end of the day, the reason why we're engaging with this story is because and again, to, to speak to you know the lovely goals in this project is we're not just trying to create a nice piece of art or a nice you know gaming experience. We're creating this because the purpose is to create meaningful change. And so, if you want people to engage, you've got to take them as close as you can to the center of that experience. You know, I think back to um, this is not a documentary, but 
the way I felt when I was in the theater watching Saving Private Ryan for the first time and, you know, the, the heightened film speed and the just the intensity of that story. I remember walking out of there so tense and this was an exactly that same experience, but it was just something I'd never experienced with a film before. So um, for our listeners, it's this super immersive world that is like, you know, graphic shapes that are flowing in the background and you've got the voiceover of, of, of real people who were there experiencing this thing. And you've got some, some uh, film footage of, of the people and you sort of see them three dimensionally and you can move your head around and see different things that are happening all while this really intense storyline is building. And it, it's just, um, it's almost like an impressionist painting, like being inside of a, of a, of something that is, uh, very artistic. I'm, I'm just curious what your, um, what the creative vision was to kind of bring these different elements together to create such a striking mood. Uh, yeah, so, um, it's a good question. I mean, you know, in terms of our overall creative, um, goal was we wanted to make people feel uncomfortable. Like we, we wanted to, as I said before, take them close to this moment and try and live this experience. And so we wanted it to be scary and uncomfortable and, mm -hmm. and because that's the reality. Um, but we also didn't want it to be overly nihilistic. We wanted to people to come out of the back of that, that, that experience and feel like there was, um, there's hope. You know, and there is, you know, meaningful community that they can be a part of and that they as an individual do have agency in this issue. So that was that was one of the goals, to, I guess, to think about the the physical representation of it. There are a few things that were like really core cool to how we put it together. The first was how we created these characters and, then, you know, in VR experiences with human characters in, in them, there's you have a finite number of choices about what a headset can can, can bear and, and, you know, the resolutions that we're dealing with. And we knew that if we had CG characters, we'd struggle to get past the, the uncanny valley and that then empathy with these characters was going to become more distant. And so we knew from the outset that it was going to be volumetric capture. And so therefore we had to take all of our characters into a volumetric studio, which is super state of the art to create these assets and hopefully that creates more of an, an emotional response and then in terms of the art direction that we built around I think one of the things that we were really fascinated in from the word go is that the threat of nuclear Armageddon is is this close it's around us all the time like you know it, it is here right now but it's something that we're able to suppress it's something that we're able to not engage with so but we wanted to create the um an art direction that from the moment that first text message lands, we kind of descend into, you know, the, it's, we, we called it like the, the cabin pressure, like lo the loss mm -hmm. of cabin pressure. And all of a sudden the environment, which has been photorealistic to that point kind of dissolves into this molecular environment and it's much darker and it's suggestive of this, the nuclear shadow that hangs over all of us. And so that was something that we worked really hard. And that was at the root of this, um, the art direction that runs throughout the experience. I guess they were the two, you know, most important core concepts. I'm curious, in addition to the volumetric capture, again, mm -hmm. there's, there's, there's so many elements that are not just purely shot with a camera. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about some of the other tools and technology that you use to, to create this experience. Um, yeah. I mean, look, before you even, before, you know, before we jump into the, the technology, I would say that the other, the other, probably the most important element that we added in early early doors was was Jamaica's um, input to, to the, the project because um, Jamaica, who's one of our co-writers, she was also one of the contributors and we first met when we were interviewing her about her experiences on that day. But she spoke so powerfully, not just about her experience that day, but of the wider complex issues that made that event possible. And she's also an incredibly um, uh, talented activist and poet. And um, so we asked Jamaica if she'd be prepared to write a poem that somehow lyrically managed to compress a lot of these complex issues that we were trying to fit into this experience. And for those who haven't yet experienced the, the project, she created this um, mind-blowing piece of spoken word poetry, which 
both gives the project its name on the morning you wake to the end of the world, but also forms the, the, the backbone, the spine of each of the, of the chapters. And I think what that does is it, it allows users to unpack uh, lots of these issues in a really lyrical way and engage with them in a ly really lyrical way so that it's not just being, you know, you're not just being hammered with stats and history. Um, you know, it, it, it flows into you in a way that I think it has a real emotional impact. Um, so for me, that's more important than any of the technology we use. And, and as I said before, we kind of come from a storytelling documentary background. And so I think we would only really engage with the technology if it really is in service of the story. And, and for me, nothing else does that like, like her poem. When we first set out to make this, the plan was that we would travel to Hawaii and that we would interview people on the ground um, about their experiences that day and that, that we would capture them volumetrically and we would capture their natural environments, their own homes, gardens, um, local communities. And we would you'd do that using technology like photogrammetry or LIDAR. Uh, we spent most of 2018 creating a proof of concept, um, which was enough for us to raise the full budget for the project, um, which we've done by just about the end of 2019. Uh, and then, of course, the pandemic came along, which meant there would be no mm. possibility for us to travel to Hawaii. So then what actually happened is we conducted all of our interviews remotely, exactly as we are doing now. And then we were really backed into a corner that we couldn't, um, you know, capture local environments using LIDAR or photogrammetry, but that really forced us to think outside the box. So we have each of our contributors send us reference image, imagery. Um, and we did work with some teams on the ground in Hawaii, and then we were able to build all of these environments so that they were as authentic to our contributors as, as they possibly could be. So that meant building you know, town centers or bedrooms or beaches, um, all in the Unity game engine. Um, but then try to often emulate this look, which is, um, I guess, more um, more familiar to photogrammetry or LIDAR because we wanted this kind of molecular particle um, texture to everything, which for us was suggestive of the technology at the heart of these weapons in the first place. Yeah, very interesting. Um... Tell me more about the COVID piece of this. So and obviously a lot of the production happened during this. So was, was a lot of it remote and distributed or how did that impact your ability to collaborate on this project? Well, I, I would say it hampered us greatly. It also, uh, you know, COVID in a way uh, really accelerated the speed with which people got comfortable with zoom and working remotely and so by the mm -hmm. time we were halfway through this project actually i think a lot of the problems that that might have existed with a studio in france you know a creative team in new york creative team in london collaborators in hawaii um really i, I think the, the the only challenge was the time difference like actually covid uh maybe got people used to this very quickly um probably our biggest challenge was when we were shooting volumetrically to, to try and give users a listeners sense of what a volumetric capture studio is it is a circular green screen studio with an array of um, in this case 120 hd cameras and i think 140 infrared sensors all pointed at a center capture space which is about two meters um, in diameter and those the infrared sensors capture a mesh of any object which is in that space and the inf and then the hd cameras capture imagery which is stitched together and then projected onto the mesh and creates a kind of hologram. Um, shooting in a volumetric space, which is two meters wide, is pretty challenging in the middle of a lockdown uh, <laughs> because we had a crew of about 60 people and social distancing in place. So um, that threw up some um, interesting challenges. It changed the way we had to not just shoot those scenes, but even direct those scenes, the way that we were able to interact. You know, there are scenes where, you know, we have kids climbing into a storm drain, um, which is something that happened in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. um, you know, parents are putting their kids into storm drains um, for, for protection. And we were reenacting the scene in a volumetric studio. And you've got two kids, uh, you know, 10, eight and 10 years old climbing into a storm drain. And you can't, when you're directing that scene, even be in the same space as them. So you're kind of doing it from outside the studio, shouting in. And so um, it threw up some challenges. But at the end of the day, I think all of those are, were pretty insurmountable compared to, you know, the objective of the project, which is 
to rid the world of these weapons. So, um, you know, it's, it, every day you're like, this is pretty easy really compared to what people like lovely about it against. Yeah, for sure. Um, I understand you're making the film festival circuit at this point. Tell us a little bit about any, any news on those fronts. Yeah, sure. I feel like I've been speaking for ages. So I'm going <laughs> to buy uh, this one to Michaela and she, maybe she can give you an update on uh, how we'd be doing on the festival circuit. Yeah. So what's amazing about this project is that it's actually broken up into three chapters. So each chapter is about 11 to 15 minutes long. So if you watch all three chapters together, it's a 45 minute long experience. Um, we found, you know, sometimes in the festival circuit, people don't have 45 minutes to sit and spend with a VR experience. They're so enamored with everything interactive and immersive. They just want to get through things. So we've been finding that Sometimes just showcasing chapter one for the first 15 minutes as a 20 to 30 minute experience is the perfect length of time. Um, but that being said, we were able to kind of milk the premiere of this experience. So Sundance was our chapter one take cover um, world premiere uh, for 2022 in January. And then South by Southwest was chapters two and chapters three's world premiere. Um, and then from there, we launched to the Oculus store for free um, and for the public at the end of March. <clears throat> Since then, we have been invited to other festivals um, to showcase the experience. I would say there was a festival um, in Latin America that we showcased, in Spain that we showcased. The ones that I'm most familiar with is the one happening in New Zealand, in Dock Edge. There's some really interesting conversations happening with amazing film festivals in London and the UK that Steve could probably speak to more about. And I think the reality is, is that the festival circuit is important for sort of the livelihood of the VR experience. Um, and while it is interesting to us for the impact campaign to be able to showcase it at all these amazing spaces, the festival circuit tends to be a bit of a chamber echo. Um, you tend to find that it's sort of the same people, especially if it's VR related, um, kind of going and seeing the same things over and over again throughout the festival circuit. So my job and my work as an impact producer is to kind of break out of the festival circuit. And even though it's somewhat difficult to get headsets to the public, even though it's kind of a lot easier to just showcase a 2D film widespread, screen it at a bunch of universities and in high schools um, or a lot of different government dignitaries spaces. Um, my goal is to bring accessibility both ways. It's to make sure we're making the experience as accessible as possible, depending on the audience that we're working with, but also making sure the technology is accessible as possible whenever possible. So we're bringing 20 headsets to the Nobel Peace Center which is our first museum activation we're doing. We're gonna have over 40 high school classrooms come through the door to do a special field trip with the Nobel Peace Center around nuclear disarmament. The experience is also going to be showcased during a very large nuclear disarmament summit conference or summit that the Nobel Peace Center is putting together where government dignitaries from all over Europe will be discussing this issue before the meeting of state parties in Vienna. We're also bringing headsets to Vienna. We're also bringing headsets to Times Square to showcase it to the public in Times Square. So thinking about different ways we're showing this outside of the festival circuit is also something that I'm working on and Lovely's working on. So um, we're really excited about the festival circuit. It's a really important part of the process, but I think for the impact side of things, uh, we're equitably more excited about all of the amazing opportunities we have to bring the show, bring the piece and the headsets to other spaces like classrooms, like universities, places government dignitaries and politicians are a part of, places that public might not be as exposed to this type of storytelling or might not be as aware of the intensity and the impact of nuclear disarmament as a movement. They're pretty aware now because of the recent events with Ukraine and Russia that the nuclear weapon still exists and that it's still something that global politicians use today as uh, ways to kind of push fear out and into the world. But they're not as aware that there's an amazing movement around disarming these weapons, eradicating these weapons. And that's what's really exciting about bringing those into spaces. Well, I, I think uh, the timing of this film is really important, given all of the rhetoric. And uh, ev even if it is just politicians 
talking and threatening and whatever. It, it's real. <laughs> this is even if it's the, if the likelihood is low or the likelihood is high, that it's a real threat and the buttons exist. And, um, you know, I I grew up as a kid in the in the 80s. Um, and even then, like we there was still real threat of, you know, we would hear about like this is a thing that could happen during the Cold War. Um, and I can't help but think not just with Hawaii, but all the things that are going on in Russia and Ukraine, um, how important this film is at the moment. Um, uh, lovely. Maybe I'll direct this question to you, but, you know, people who are who are watching this film and are touched by it um, and wonder, like, what can I do? Like, I'm I'm just a person at home. You know, I'm just a citizen. How how can they get involved or what are some things that you would encourage uh, listeners and viewers to to check out? Yeah. Um, before I go into that, I think it's really important to acknowledge something that you said, Josh, um, that for um, many people today, um, especially younger people who weren't, you know, born in the 1940s, um, which was the advent of the nuclear age or lived through the 50s and 60s when the world witnessed sort of the intense nuclear arms race between the United States and Russia, it's really easy to put, you know, nuclear weapons out of sight, out of mind. Uh, and then ever so often there will be a threat that will sort of raise it above like our consciousness again. And mm -hmm. that's when we panic. And then all of a sudden it will like die down again and we'll forget. Um, and so I think that this film really hits home this idea that they've always existed. Right. Um, and that, you know, all this time, more countries have actually acquired them. Um, there are about nine countries known to have nuclear weapons today, but, you know, younger generations were, I guess, spared from the tangibility of these weapons because of that on and off sort of threat experience with them. And on top of that, you also have um, pop culture references, almost fantasizing um, and, and making them more like sci-fi um, artifacts as opposed to real um, weapons, real live weapons. Um, if you look at video games, movies, and and so on, so it has this really interesting effect of of blending sort of fact and, and fiction. Um, and then, as you pointed out, now it's incredibly palpable. Um, there are a lot of nuclear um, specialists, activists who are really worried that the conflict would escalate um, in Ukraine with the use of nuclear weapons, especially the more protracted it gets. So this is really shaping up to be like a really critical moment for the public to be attuned to what nuclear risk is. Um, so in terms of getting involved, I would say that this film really centers the idea of nuclear abolition, which is an, an apologetic, no more nukes stance. And it's understandable that for some people that may seem really impossible, right? Like I said, there's like nine nuclear weapon states now. There's thousands of, of nuclear weapons sort of spread among those nine countries. But one thing that um, I think a lot of people don't know is that there is such thing as the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, or TPNW for short. Um, it's a UN treaty that started off um, in a signatory state back in 2017. And actually in 2021, it entered into force. So now it's an actual international treaty that every country must abide by. Um, and I think that this film is an opportunity to raise awareness around the fact that this treaty exists. And when we start talking about new, the use of nuclear weapons in any context, that's actually illegal. Um, and I think that going back to sort of what I do as a nuclear expert, I think this also challenges a lot of the my, my fellow experts, scholars, to really see this treaty as sort of a serious 
piece of, of our knowledge base. Um, it's not just about um, arms control where we bring down numbers, you know, little by little, get um, country, get away with, you know, basically threatening other countries with nuclear weapons. I think that there's a lot to be done about really devaluing nuclear weapons in sort of countries' nuclear security postures. And so I think that there is also that need for the public to demand that kind of accountability from governments, especially those that have nuclear weapons, to really see this treaty as serious business and actually create policies that align with that. Um, so I think part of what folks can do is um, have conversations with family and friends about nuclear risk, even just acknowledging that we don't even really know what that means, right, mm -hmm. in the modern day mm -hmm. right. context. And just being really honest about not knowing. And then from there, reaching out to organizations um, that um, have that information and are community led because they do exist. Um, and then from there, just see what the emergent possibilities are. Uh, because again, this is really, this the notion of nuclear abolition has been around for a really long time, but the fact that the TPNW exists really sort of solidifies it as something that like you can't ignore anymore. And we have to start mobilizing around it. So for, for each of you, I'm curious, you know, the, obviously the film is, complete and it sounds like the the rollout and the marketing of it is still actively happening right now but i'm i'm cur curious what the kind of near term future looks like for you will each of you be kind of continuing into more things along the theme of um you know nuclear related uh initiatives or um you know other other big ideas are there other things that you're you're thinking about as a as a next step Um, so I'm also a multidisciplinary artist, similar to Lovely. Um, so while my hat for this role and this project is impact producer and creative strategist, I also create and direct my own XR experiences. So currently um, working on a trilogy that brings to light lesser known mythologies and folk fables and folklore using the uh, Quill platform, which is a painting platform in VR. Mm. Um, I'm also going to probably continue my work with uh, Games for Change under their vertical XR for Change. And there's a lot of really amazing projects we're speaking to about, you know, really fleshing out what it is to be XR for Change, whether that's, you know, helping other projects with their impact campaigns, projects about schizophrenia or body dysmorphia or projects um, about immigration even into like, how do we create curriculum where students in high schools and elementary schools and universities can learn about this type of technology and how they can tell stories and how they can create their own games to tell their own stories using XR technology, um, all the way to, you know, how can we use these technologies for health and wellness as well? Like who's developing, you know, the work to support people who are recovering from PTSD or to support people who are in spaces that are not as healthy. Can we use these kind of immersive technologies to treat and help prevent um, or to uh, help people recover? So there's a lot of different verticals XR for change sits in. So I think I will be very busy in the next few uh, years, if not months, um, working with them and collaborating with them. So um that's kind of what's happening outside of On the Morning You Wake, but especially with On the Morning You Wake, we're going to continue this impact campaign nice and strong, at least through 2022 into 2023. Um, and my hope is that we're continuing to equip collaborators to help us sustain the impact campaign, right? So it's not just about loaning headsets out to organizations, but actually looking at purchasing headsets for organizations and giving them to organizations and saying, you are going to continue doing this nuclear disarmament work long after, you know, I've kind of had to move on from this project. So my hope is if I purchase this headset for you and I give you access to on the morning you wake and I give you access to the impact materials, you can continue doing the work and using this work in your day-to-day -day lives as grassroots organizers, grass tops um, organizers um, within different organizations that are working to continue to 
spread the awareness around the treaty, spread the awareness around the countries who have not signed the treaty, um, as well as within schools and curriculums, so that there's a long-standing impact of the impact campaign long after I sort of release my uh, my producerial skills on it. <laughs> Excellent. All right, lovely. What's next for you? Oh, yeah, all good. Um, so given that I am very much in the nuclear field. All of my future projects are uh, related to nuclear issues. Um, two that I'm really excited about um, are Ways of Knowing and Bloom. So Ways of Knowing is actually a 360 VR film as well. Uh, we started this project back in 2016, um, and it's a collaboration with um, Navajo uh, community members uh, who live in New Mexico, Arizona, essentially Navajo land. Um, and basically their experience with um, u- uranium mining in, in that area. So it's a community-led effort as well. Um, we actually finished um, filming it, but there's a lot of post-production work and mm-hmm. we decided to take a beat um, once like COVID happened because Navajo Nation was really affected by, by the pandemic. Um, and so hopefully now that things are reaching the endemic state, um, that we'll be able to, to continue on with, with that project. But it's something that I'm really proud of. Again, just really understanding nuclear issues from a completely different prism of land. Um, land stewardship, uh, indigenous knowledge, uh, and, and so forth. So that's really exciting. Um, and then Bloom is a book. It's an art book about the flora and fauna that has been affected by nuclear catastrophe and diplomacy. Um, a lot of people think about just human security when it comes to nuclear weapons, like how do we protect ourselves? But there's actually a lot you can learn from the landscapes around us, the plants around us. Um, Mm -hmm. One thing that I'll note is that um, ginkgo trees um, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki actually survived the nuclear attack um, in in 1945. Um, So there's documentation of certain plant life that were still standing amongst scorched buildings and what have you. Yeah. And so we're just doing this book around these different flowers and and plants as a way to process survival and resilience. And I think that that will really resonate with us today who just pretty much survived a really traumatic event that is the pandemic. Um, And so trying to figure out ways to communicate nuclear knowledge that lands really um, softly emotionally to to people today so those are I mean I have other projects but those are the two that I'm really excited about I'm sure there's a Spongebob Squarepants joke to be made about Bloom like the, all the <laughs> I think oh, that yeah. was like loosely tied to the bikini yeah. toll or whatever yeah actually just recently, um, recently learned that <laughs> Yeah, there's uh, there's a lot about SpongeBob actually, but that's for another podcast. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> yeah, very cool. Uh, Steve, what's what's next on the docket for you? Uh, yeah, uh, we got um, well, uh, I've got a team of six editors around me here. We have got a, a first cut delivery on a, on another feature film uh, tomorrow. Uh, we've got another film going to Tribeca and then a couple of other projects that are going to be out later this year. So we've got, um, got lots of projects in production that range from feature doc to uh, immersive experiences to um, scripted series and, and features. Um, so plenty busy on all of those things. But, you know, I think to kind of bring it back to Morning Awake, I think what's super exciting for us that makes that project really unique is it that is you know, what Michaela and the team at Games for Change are pushing through in terms of activations and impact campaign and, and, and audience engagement because just 
you know, compared to other linear films that we'll be working on, it's just a completely different level of engagement with your user, with your audience. Mm-hmm. And, you know, how amazing to have several, you know, 30 classes of school children come in and, you know, to physically walk them through that experience and talk about something that's important, so as important as this. Um, I re- personally, I really believe that, you know, in terms of, there's, I guess this kind of references back what Michaela said before, that, that those who know about immersive or those who are in the immersive space or working in the immersive space or passionate about it, um, you know, it's, it's kind of a, still a small um, community. Mm-hmm. But I think we're really, you know, ordinarily when you, when you deliver a film, I guess you would consider that the kind of the end of your journey. And, and really, I think we're really it's almost day one of, un- of understanding the possibilities and the potential of, of what we can do with an experience like this and how audiences who are not from the traditional kind of immersive space or, um, you know, going to those festivals engage with experiences like this. And that this, you know, this experience has given us the chance to get so many people into the headset for the first time and say, wow, I did not even know that this was possible. I didn't know that you could tell stories in this way. And for me, that's kind of the most exciting part now that um, rather than it feeling like the end of a project, the delivery project, I feel like we've kind of got a lot of track in front of us and, and may, maybe many, many other iterations of this project that we don't yet know about. And that's exciting. Well, hey, the, the theme of this show is is being obsessed <laughs> with, with many things for most of our uh, guests. Uh, I can't let you guys go without asking each of you um, the question I ask everybody, which is, and this could be film related, could be nuclear related, could be anything in life, really. I'm just curious what each of you find that you are most obsessed with right now. Somebody else go. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a nuclear related answer and a personal answer. Can I yeah, go share for both? It. Sure. Okay. Um, nuclear related, I'm really obsessed with the atom, like as an artifact. Um, mm. it's, it's a lot of people don't really think about it, um, at all. Uh, but in my field, the atom is somewhat contentious because it can use it for peaceful uses, you know, for research, for energy, what have you. And then you have the weapons side of things. Uh, and so there's a lot of philosophy around, you know, how do we as humans steward atomic science and how the image of the atom itself has evolved over time from like the Bohr model to, you know, like what we see now on our, you know, modern day textbooks and how like image um, and sort of like public perception and policy kind of combine to like create this like really multi-dimensional like um, understanding of, of this really tiny thing that no one can see. So I'm like incredibly fascinated by the atom. Um, You're definitely anyway, the first like guest mirror. to say the atom as <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> probably first and last, yeah, but that, that's awesome. There's, <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's so much more to say, but that's like the simplest, quickest way can describe that. But from a personal um, uh, aspect, I would say that I'm really obsessed with the notion of rest <laughs> at the moment. Mm. Um, I think uh you know, we're still in a pandemic, um, more and more we're able to do more things, which is Mm -hmm. great, but I'm really trying to resist going 500 miles per hour. Um, and just really learning the lessons that quiet and stillness and resting really afforded me the past two years. Um, and so just, just making sure that I, um, I'm able to give myself the time. And I think it, it goes back to our conversation around creativity, right? The more you mm-hmm. kind of are attuned to your body, listen to your body, the more creativity will open up because you're actually listening to yourself. So um, that's been true for me and, and I'm, I'm going to be sticking with that. So I'm obsessed with, with rest yeah, right it. now. <laughs> cool. So uh, I feel like this definitely is the thing that 
that is my why about the world, about my life. Um, I'm obsessed with experience design and experience can be everything that creates a memory. So I'm just obsessed with the idea that like you can build and create something in the digital reality. You can build and create something in the physical reality and people will walk away and have like a memory that's been made from it. And so whether it's assistant directing a dance show, which I just currently, uh, we just currently wrapped a dance show about the trauma cycles of like recovery and, and, and disruption in lives to, and like creating that on like dance bodies and dancing and performing that myself, creating that experience all the way to like what we're doing with on the morning you awake with building and creating activations, or even just creating like a type form survey that students will take just like anything that people will immerse or interact with like I'm obsessed with creating and building that and whether it's narrative driven or documentary driven or or social impact driven um I really feel like that's my why it's like what I'm obsessed with doing and and the way that I like to think about my type of experience design or what I'm always trying to do better is how we can do compassionate and considerate experience design right like an architect can build a building it can feel very cold and it can feel very not approachable and that's definitely not my style like I feel like as experienced design architect like I want it to be warm and welcoming and considerate and compassionate to people to make a more inclusive diverse um, equitable future I like that that's really cool all right Steve uh, I hope you've well, had time gonna, to think uh, now <laughs> <laughs> no, well actually uh, just to sort of make it um, well what I'm obsessed with right now and in, in the room surrounded by me, I'm obsessed and uh, have been obsessed for a few weeks. We're working on a project which, um, on which we've been thrown a mountain uh, of archive material, which is 30 odd years old and all shot on 35 mil and multiple mm-hmm. angles, huge events. And this stuff is, is incredible. And it's absolutely incredible. And, and it's, the, the change for me has been, I think that's, you know, what's amazing about the creative world now that we're able to move between these different kinds of projects, but the project mm-hmm. that we're discussing on the morning you wake, uh, it, you know, is so kind of bleeding edge in terms of technology used to tell that story. Yeah. And then there's been this amazing return, I guess, to this analog world for me, which is not just, like, it's not just about like oh, the beauty and the textures of 35 mil and what cellular it looks like. It's, you know, you're looking through reels of film where somebody 30 years ago has made choices, they made creative choices. You can see them scanning, thinking, where am I going to point the camera? What am I going to pick up next? Yeah. And those, the choices of these individuals, a great many of them, in a really, you know, you can really feel that, the way that impacts a project now. And for me, it just couldn't be further from the project that we're, that we, you know, we're speaking about now in this podcast. And I, like, for me, I'm, the rest of the team, uh, I think, a little bit bored of me just all day going, oh, my God, this is incredible. This is the best thing I've ever seen. And, you, you know, when you've spent the last three years of your life, like, detailing the minutiae of something in a really kind of forensic way and having to work remotely and not, not having any kind of tactility with, with the material, this is a, a very welcome um, change. So, and, and also teaches you that there's something that you thought, you think that you've moved past technologically, but there's always... When you look back at something, you see a new freshness to it. And um, yeah, I'm really enjoying that. Well, excellent. Um, before we wrap up here, uh, Steve, maybe you can go first on this one. Give us a, a little info on where our listeners can learn more about you, find more about you and more about the project. Yeah, I mean, look, uh, the best place you can find out about the project is on our website, which is on the morning you wake dot org. Um. Oh. <laughs> and I think uh, that is that's the best place where you can find out about us, the creative team, the, the history of the project, but most importantly, the, the steps that you can take um, to, to join the community. Um, yeah. Michaela, where can we uh, where can we watch the film? Oh, that's a great question. So the, um, if anyone owns a Quest 2 headset, you can watch the film for free on the app store. Um, you just search morning you wake or on the morning you wake and it usually po- automatically pops up. The full title is on the morning you wake to the end of the world, but you don't need to type the whole thing out. Um, and then you just wait for the whole six plus gig 
file to download. It takes about maybe five to 10 minutes, depending on who you are and what kind of Wi-Fi you have. And then you can watch it there. Chapters one through three are all available. If you do not have a Quest 2 headset, but you're interested in checking out the piece and or collaborating with us as a partner, um, and a partner is a very loose term, uh, it could be someone who is a teacher at a school all the way to someone who wants to bring the project to Japan or to Korea or to Australia um, or somewhere else. Uh, you can actually go onto the website, morningyouwake.com, scroll all the way down to the bottom. In our footer, we have a interest form uh, that's called screen the project and you just click screen the project and then you can fill out that type form and that'll um, help notify our team that you're interested and we'll get in contact with you very shortly about ways we can collaborate and partner with you so that the piece is seen by your community or by your classroom or maybe even just by your organization. Anywhere that uh, listeners can go to learn more about you? Oh, wow. Um, I do have a website. It's my name, Michaela Ternaski Holland.com. Uh, I also have an Instagram handle under the same name. Uh, so you can check me out there. Um, and from there, you can find me on Twitter or LinkedIn. Um, so yeah, you can stay in touch with me via my personal newsletter for all the cool, interesting things I'm up to outside of On the Morning You Wake, as well as with On the Morning You Wake. And just so you know, the project also has social media. So you can follow um, more at Morning You Wake on both Instagram and Twitter as well. And lovely anywhere uh, viewers, listeners can uh, connect with you or get involved as well. Sure. So um, I'll definitely be involved in um, On the Morning You Wake activities, writing videos and such. Um, so you'll be able to, to find me there. Um, once viewers, listeners can, uh, have access to, to the film or want to learn about the film, uh, through on the morning you Uh, but on my personal capacity, you can find me at, um, my website, which is just my name, lovely I'm also on, um, Instagram, uh, under the handle bomb Shelto. So that's just at bomb Shelto. And again, like my personal, uh, arts and policy collective is, is bomb Shelto. So yeah, that's where you'll find me. Excellent. Love it. Uh, well, it's been a pleasure chatting with the three of you again, just an incredible project that you guys have, have pulled together and, um, uh, unlike anything I've ever experienced before. So kudos to that. Um, and thank you all for being on the show today. Appreciate that. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks for having us. Thanks to you. And of course, thank you for being obsessed with design. Okay, kids, that's episode number 171 in the books. For all of today's show notes, head over to obsessedshow.com. Add your email address to our newsletter. I'll update you on some of my favorite new episodes and some cool things I find in my daily obsessions. Of course, all the links are over at obsessedshow.com to all the places you can find this show, iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, Google Play, and Spotify. So no matter where you find your podcasts, chances are you can listen to Obsessed Show from there. Just head over to obsessedshow.com. The Obsessed Show is produced by yours truly, Josh Miles. To have me speak or MC at your next event, head over to joshmiles.com to learn more. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.